This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, a good Sunday morning to you. Well, good Sunday morning to you, Scott. How are you feeling? For our listeners, Scott and I have, uh, over the past couple of months, both suffered bouts of COVID and, and have recovered very nicely, it seems, as I'm looking across the uh, the council here. But how are you feeling? Feel better. Feel better. Uh, Artie was the fir- big, big proponent of the Plaxovid, the therapeutics. Yes. I got it in New York when I was in New York on May 20th, and I tested, uh, <laughs> I tested positive and four days later negative. So I was a big proponent of Paxlovid and following the doctor's orders and taking vitamin D and all the other sort of things. Yeah, I think if, if all in all, the bout with it was not as bad as I thought it would be, but it was definitely different than your common cold. Right. Uh, no question about that. But helping people. Yeah, helping people. Today we, we are going to be talking about Families First a really great organization here in Missoula, led by uh, Hannah uh, Zoroff, and um, doing all kinds of things with children and families. And we're going to hear about the infamous fairy kits, which I want to know more about. And uh, she'll be telling us a story about how this program embedded in the new library is making such a difference on families' lives here in Missoula and Lake County. And you've been to the library. What were your thoughts? I, it's a fantastic facility. I love libraries. I remember 20 years ago, I went to our sister city in New Zealand, wow. which was Palmerston North. And one of the things they took me on a tour of was their new library at that time. And their library had showers and a coffee shop and places for people to rest. And it took on a complete, it was the first library I'd ever seen that saw itself as a community focal point and was providing services, you know, way beyond just, you know, the you know, lending book services that I grew up with. So I was really impressed with that. And what we have now in Missoula is that kind of service program on steroids. Which is great. I mean, it's it's one of the gifts of Missoula that few people take advantage of. And we're going to learn a lot about it today with Anna. Arnie, we live in a magical part of the country. We know that, right? That's why you've been here for going 25 on, years. 25 years. I've been here going on 10 And uh, something like a family's first to me is why Missoula is different than any other place, certainly in Montana, but in the region and in the country for that. Well, we have a a disproportionate number compared to many other cities of uh, not-for-profit organizations. And primarily it's because the community is interested in in helping itself become the best community it can become. So, and if anyone wants to know about what the value of having these types of services and 501c3s in their community is, is that you've got a community that's vibrant, that's economically vibrant, that is, you know, um, socially and culturally vibrant. So the benefits of having, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, know, cornucopia of 501c3s and nonprofits you see the benefits in right. the day-to-day life. And today we're going to focus in on Hannah Zoroff and Families First and how they play such an integral part in the puzzle of uh, Montana uh, social service agencies. I'm looking forward to it. When we come back, our guest, Hannah Zoroff, Executive Director of Families First. Back after this. Arnie Sherman, we are back with our guest, the Executive Director of Families First, Hannah Zoroff. Hannah, good to have you here this morning. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. So for our listeners who aren't familiar with your organization, tell us a little bit about Families First and what you do. Yeah. So we've been in the Missoula community for 28 years. Um, We kind of have two main parts to our mission. One is our child enrichment work, which really focuses on learning through play, um, kindergarten readiness. And we uh, actually have a lot of exhibits in the Missoula Public Library. Um, So that's kind of how we carry out that part of our mission. And then our second part is family education, where we try and support parents through building resilience with peer peer support, um, connection opportunities throughout Missoula, um, not just at our home base in the library, and then a lot of divorce and separation support. So there are many community-based not-for-profits in Missoula. There are. And I assume you coordinate and cooperate with a number of them. But what's unique about what you're doing compared to other 
organizations that counsel kids or work with families. Yeah, definitely. So we serve all families, no matter of the, no matter their background or where they're coming from. Um, like I said, we do serve the Missoula community, but we're also all in Lake County too. Um, so a lot of work gets done on the reservation through Families First Learning Lab. Um, and a key piece that you just mentioned was partnerships. So we really pride ourselves on not duplicating services. And anytime that we have to do something that another organization is doing too, um, we work with them and bring them in to where you know both entities are benefiting. And where does your money come from? <laughs> Important question in this town, right? Yeah, how do you, how, how do you make this happen? How are this? we funded? Right. Yeah, so we have um, a lot of grant funding. Uh, it's about 70% of our budget, but we are trying to refocus that and diversify through really spreading our story throughout the Missoula community and getting you know folks all around involved with our work, whether that's attending a summer camp or taking a parenting class, um, volunteering with us. We, we want to you know get Missoulians involved with what we're doing. So um, hoping to shift that a little bit away from, from grants. And how long have you been there? And what's your background? Yeah. So I have been with Families First for about three and a half years now and then acting as director for two years. And prior to that, I was our family education director. So leading our parenting programs, really reviving a lot of that work because we didn't have a home since the Children's Museum closed down in 2017. So we were operating through our partnerships, which is why that's such a critical part of our mission now to maintain that. Um, really virtually and without a home. So um, yeah, I love what I do. I love working with families. I started on the programming side of things and learned that I loved fundraising and managing such an incredible team that I have. So my background is in psychology and sociology, and then I have a degree in nonprofit management too. And you're working in your doctor? From the university? From where? From U of M? From U of M, yeah. They just know how to keep me staying in school apparently i'm pursuing my doctorate right now in public health with a social work emphasis Um, holy mackerel yeah so it can kind of be busy where are you (laughs) you're originally from montana the whereabouts here in missoula in missoula yeah both my parents graduated out at frenchtown high school um, oh you're kidding yeah i my mom formerly worked at the missoulian and transferred us to northern nevada where i went to school but i have been itching to get back here ever since to go to school. Scott, so we have a guest on the show that loves to raise money. How come you love to raise money? Nobody <laughs> likes to raise money. Right. How come you like it? I like it because I'm raising money for a cause I care about. I mean, the story tells itself when you see a parent break down and be able to say that they're functioning because of how you helped them or a teen that's getting life skills, um, that you're able to you know, support them in a way that will manifest long after they're 18. Um, That's why I do the work I do. And even like the play and the magic that is inspired with all the kids, it's it's pretty special. So you're on the second floor of the new library. How do you like being there? It's incredible. It is the biggest blessing for our organization. We have this all under one roof model. So we partner with the other entities in the library, like Spectrum Discovery Area, the library, MCAT, um, and then there's actually a research lab through the University of Montana Psychology Department. So we all work together really well, and it's been such a great way to share resources, um, save a little money, but also get out in front of the community in a way that's not stigmatized. You should also work with the radio station there because we just gifted them their signal. Yeah. 101.5. So that just happened. No, um, we know. <laughs> <laughs> super exciting for us. Yeah, we um, formerly have partnered with MCAT quite a bit to stream a lot of our events, but this radio station is going to be pretty amazing to have. It's got a strong signal. And is it Jesse Blumenthal? He is the uh, executive director. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to meet him. Quite Go intro. He's on the first floor. He's where... Um, so they've already moved in. They're where MCAT is. Perfect. Okay. I didn't realize that was already like done. It, it we was just got just updated. done. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Can't he's wait. great. So one of the things that's uh, um, another blessing about being at the public library is that you're working with some people that are referred by the court and sometimes there's stigma associated with uh, with uh, working with uh, people that, are, that have been adjudicated or court referrals, but... Walking into a library is is sort of a neutral, vanilla 
you know, kind of a place to operate out of and probably mm-hmm. eases some of the concerns rather than walking into a courthouse or a probation office or someplace like that. Is, yeah. that, is that a, an accurate assessment? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think the library is also a great place for preventative care, right? So right. we're able to reach parents before they need us in a court-ordered manner. Um, and when someone comes in for a parenting class, you know, and they walk through the Missoula Public Library doors, no one knows that they're coming for a parenting class. And right. there's a, a lot of magic in that. Yeah, uh, it certainly makes sense to me. How many people a year do you serve? Oh, man. Um, so last year, we served 20,000 just with our fairy kits. And that is something I know I have some weird looks right now. Like, what's fairy, a fairy kit? She, she's giving out 20,000 <laughs> fairy 20, kits. So that's 20,000 people or families. So it's kids or parents. Kids or parents. Yep. So and some of those could be that? repeated too. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, got it. Got it. Got it. It's just kind of, we don't like to ask for a lot of demographic information just right. because that can deter some families from getting services. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we found this really fun way to bring our learning through play and parenting tips to people at their doorsteps. And so those are our fairy kits. Um, yeah, we distributed 20,000 last and year. And what is in a fairy kit? Yeah, so it's an activity. So one example is we have um, chalk letters of kindness. So the kids will get some sticks of chalk in their bag. And then the objective is the parents will interact with the kids while they're doing the activity that's guided on their little sheet. And there's parenting tips that go along with it. So maybe talking about the importance of kindness with your kids or how to build community, ways to get out in Missoula. So we have these like little talking points to where the parents are also engaging with the kids at the same time that they're playing on the sidewalk with chalk. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that, Scott, is where else do you have somebody working with families telling them you should talk about kindness and you should talk about, uh, you know, building relationships and you should talk about Mm -hmm. sharing with your neighbors. Well, I was going to say, just in listening to Hannah talk about how you were brought up, it sounds like you were brought up in a a really supportive family. Yeah. And what it feels like is you're trying to create that experience for people that may not have been as fortunate. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And that to me is... We take it for granted, right? You take and but you don't. You're actually. I want to pay it forward. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, there's a generational component to it too, where, right? You know, if you if you're a parent that had awesome parents, you're gonna you're gonna know how to do that because you've seen it in action. So, what we want to do is try and reach some folks that may not have had the best mentors as, for parenting. Modeling, yeah, it's, it's some modeling. modeling. Right. Exactly. And you have a lot of single parent families too, and multi parent families. Yeah, there's fathers or mothers that are one one removed now who are right. still involved in their lives. I mean, it gets complicated over yeah, time. Yeah, definitely. And your point with fathers too, um, we see a lot of single dads nowadays. And we actually just launched a program last summer called Dads in Dialogues. And it's the first support group for, for fathers in the state of Montana. So lots of resources. what are resources. their issues in general? <laughs> I mean, I don't need a specific case, but what, what are single dads coming in wanting help with? So a lot of it's peer support. Um, you know, there's not a lot of places especially that might not involve things like grabbing a drink or, <laughs> you know, yeah, outside of the bar. going out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a safe space for dads to be able to come together and talk about some of the things that they might be struggling with. So, you know, during COVID, we, we saw a lot of that with overwhelm and having to play this role as parent and teacher with dads. Um, so that was, you know, one of the topics that came up. How, what, talk to me or talk to us a little bit about daycare and about the <laughs> challenges of daycare, because... I think if for any families or any single parents or any families listening to our show that are working families, the struggle and the challenge is, is daycare. Mm-hmm. Well, right? in particular, before she was in particular, now that many companies are asking their employees to come back and not work remotely. Right. You saw Elon Musk the other day said that I want no more remote work at Tesla. Everybody's coming back to work. Right. Right. You know, so there's a, mo- a movement back now, and and that has even puts more strain on the child care on system. the system. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, So Katie Little, my child enrichment director at Families First, she is really involved in a lot of those conversations of how can we help out with this crisis, especially that our Missoula community is facing right now with childcare being so expensive, unavailable. You know, we have wait list places that are months long, even just to get into them. Um, We're kind of in a unique situation in that we don't do childcare um, at all. So how can we, you know, support childcare providers? We have training opportunities for them, workshops that they do both here and in Lake County. Um, We 
try and, you know, show that they're appreciated because oftentimes our child care providers are are underpaid. So we try and step in and do random acts of kindness for those folks in our community. But we are a little removed from, you know, some other organizations that are doing after school care or child care. Right. Right. It's so incredible how the people that are most important to the development of family and individuals and kids are not recognized financially as they should be. I saw a thing recently where there was a there was a child care working somewhere that was making uh, $8 an hour and a parking place was $10 an hour in the neighborhood. They valued a parking spot more than a person. Mm-hmm. You know, and and these are the people that obviously are the frontline um, workers. workers who are working with your kids. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's Well, it's think about teachers when you think. Yeah. yeah. What, I mean, you, do you have a hard time recruiting? Is it hard to find people in Missoula that work for what a not-for-profit can pay here? Yeah, it definitely is. And it's hard because the people on my team, I value them so much, but I want to be able to give them the world, you know, and, and that's definitely a barrier. And that's why we do so much more fundraising and why we're trying to diversify is at the end of the day, how I think of it is I want to be able to do more for the people right. doing this work. Yeah. Um, our child care providers, so... I guess we do have a little bit of child care in our work in that all of our parenting classes come with a free meal and child care provided for free. So that's one area where we do have some independent child care providers that are on a very randomized schedule. Um, but we did boost up their wages to 15 an hour just because we were able to to force that to happen. To support that? Yeah. Are, are there a lot of folks that are that have, let's say, that are were, want to help create child care in their home like there's i seem to think that there's a lot more independent kind of folks that are out there that are looking for ways like they may be retirees Mm -hmm. you know i've heard that um i'm by no means an expert in that area i know that the missoula chamber has been doing a lot of work on trying to figure out how to you know promote that in missoula um united way and zero to five have also been you know key members of trying to to make some solutions happen there um but i have not been right in the middle of that it's just such a tough issue such a tough one. And most of the businesses, particularly in the service sector that I, t- I talked to over the years on the podcast show and, in, and, and even in here on our radio show, child care is an important issue for if, if they if their workers can't get child care, they can't come to work. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and we, we see that all over, not the, not only Missoula, but all over this country. There's there's those help wanted signs in the service industry. And a lot of the reasons they're not being filled is people can't get ch- child care for their kids so they can come to work earn enough money to pay for the child care yeah. sure. you know it's a vicious cycle yeah so you mentioned twenty thousand ferry kits but what yeah uh, who, what other give me some other numbers about how many kids you work yeah with families. so um in the library we don't have like i said we don't really track as much data right. on individuals but we have hundreds of families there a week um whether they're for story time or our art with a purpose classes but we're engaging with them on some level and usually on the play-based side of learning um we try and engage the parents too so we're starting to build a relationship with them to where you know they're not as scared to come to us to ask for help because that relationship already exists um so i would say in the library just alone you know thousands throughout the year counseling In counseling, so we just launched our consultation program. So it is a little different than like traditional therapeutic counseling. Um, Again, we don't want to duplicate services and there's a lot of places doing that. Um, We provide more support on like child development. Like, hey, my kid's biting other kids. What can I do? (laughs) Right? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, so um, trying to... A muzzle. Simple (laughs) simple solution to that problem. Uh, Maybe not. (laughs) I have some long-term outcomes for the kids then. Interesting. Do you work with other organizations? Like you said, you don't want to duplicate efforts, but there's a lot of cooperative opportunities. Like I'm thinking of one one of our past guests were from the Boys Club, the Boys and Girls Club of Flathead and of Missoula Valley. Right. Right. Or the or the YMCA. Family just, YMCA has a family lot of YMCA. So, what type of dialogue is yeah. happening between organizations like your own? Yeah, so um, those are some different examples. We've partnered with the Boys and Girls Club in, um, they just launched a tech club. And so we want to kind of combine our efforts for some teen 
focused programming together there. Um, and normally it's just sitting down and having conversations with their team. Um, the Missoula Family YMCA, we have done workshops with them where we bring in an exhibit and then some of their kids' parents can come and do a parenting class like oh, good. at their facility. So we all, we always are trying to find you know, other entities we can go to to spread our footprint outside of just the library. Which is great. Another example is the Child Development Center. Um, So once a month, they actually come to our space to facilitate child development screening. So zero to five is a really critical time for child development and a time where we can find if something's going, you know, a little differently than it should be. Um, They do screenings there to where we're not, you know, doing that. The Children's Museum used to have its own space, right? Now it's incorporated into your operation. So what what does the Children's Museum (laughs) look like these days definitely so we're not your traditional museum anymore right um we for the first time ever are all under one roof with our family education program so we to be frank had an identity crisis for about 20 years of sure do you guys do parenting classes or are you a museum like what's going on here so now you know for the first time ever we're able to say we do both and here's why um you know our learning through play programs feed into our parenting programs to make a more resilient family. And in the public library, we are a part of the water room, which if you haven't been there, you definitely want to check it out. It's really beautiful. And the floor is nice and squishy too. So Uh not as messy as some water spaces might be. Um, And it's actually neat because when you look out the window, it it mimics the Clark Fork River. So um, you can see exactly like in the you know, mural that we have, what's right out the door that's being represented. So that's kind of fun. And then we have Tiny Town, which is a really fun little name, but we have uh, rotating exhibits out there where we partner with different businesses like um, Jiffy Lube, for example. They, you know, gave us a car, funds for a car mechanic area. So Uh now kids can come and work on their cars. Parents can talk to them about that. Um, So we're always looking for partnerships. Is also a library? Yeah, yep. Were you, these were you, are kids cars, not No, I know, but I'm <laughs> Were you always affiliated with the library, the old library too? We had a very small footprint in the old library. Um they were gracious enough to allow us to have some office space about the size of this office, the studio actually. Oh, wow. Um and there were four of us in there. So it was it was a little tight quarters, but at least we had a place to go to go to work. <laughs> so how did you be? How did you get chosen to take up as much space as you did? Yeah, definitely. With the new library. So that's been a long time coming. Um, I want to say those conversations started maybe seven years ago in the initial planning process, okay. and um, the Missoula li- Library team wanted someone that can be like a family resource hub in the space so families can access resources more availability sure. more more available i guess um and so we were identified as that partner and kind of chosen to be in which that is space. amazing it's incredible yeah and if any of our listeners haven't had the opportunity to go to the library and see the new library they have to get there it is tr- really an impressive like community hub mm-hmm. for missoula and anybody that ever questions, like, where are my tax dollars and my <laughs> my money going to, uh, you know, they should look at the library as a gleaning, you know, gleaming example of 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 what's the best. Yeah, yeah well, libraries of, have of changed use of that funds. Of libraries funds. have changed over time. There's a coffee shop in the library. I yeah. mean, it's becoming more like a community center with lots of other, you know, um, services and programs. And you know, you also have. Let's not forget books. One of the great things about visiting them, they have the children's library section right there. Right. Mm-hmm. So you have all the children's books that are close by. And so there's a there's a there's a melding of programs and reading and you know and education and learning and, and uh, all of that in, in one right brand in the heart new, of downtown Missoula. Bright, yeah. Beautiful, you know, space in mm-hmm. right in the heart of Missoula. In the heart of Missoula. With free parking. With free parking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't you can't beat the, the combination of things. Yep. Money. I want to talk about money for a minute. This will give you a chance. Right. Let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Hannah Zuroff. She's the executive director of Families First here in Missoula. Arnie's about money. Money. All about the money. The the Benjamins. Show me the money. Show me the Benjamins. So this is a chance to shout out to your your givers. But, you know, you're like every other not-for-profit. You're always out there raising money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so who's giving you money? And then 
if you have visions for the future, where does the new money come from? Yeah, so we did just start up an endowment, which we are very excited about. Um, you know, in our 28 year history, we've never really had something like that to draw on. And sustainability wise, it's a huge way for us to be able to, to put dollars into that. So anyone that might be a little older, if you are looking for some planned giving opportunities for some tax benefits, we have lots of those. Um, we also have so many individuals that give in our monthly giving program. So that is a really another really great sustainable way to um, donate to us. And some are five dollars a month, others are a hundred. So right. we see a vast range there. But again, that's dollars that we can get into the door month after month and predict. So right. that's a huge. And you also have money from the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation and, yep. and other sources like that. Yeah, the Washington Foundation funds our family education programs and classes that we do. Um, longtime supporters, we're really grateful. So good. And and of the donate, the individual donation, uh, the donators, is there a demographic in the aggregate you could say? Like, is it 35 plus? Is it retirees? Is it... So of our current donors, I would say the vast majority are between 35 and 40. Got That's it. really good. That's surprising. Really? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So, so they're putting the money where their their peer group are, are in need of the services. Yeah. That's or the they're, beyond, they're beyond it even. They're a little, yeah, a little bit beyond, but, mm -hmm. but still it's good. Yeah. And then we do have some that are, you know, in your retired age group. Um, but again. Like Arnie and me. Dead, the dead age group. <laughs> right. No, no, no. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, but, but, but I heard she said the tax, the, the tax benefits sure. of being able People to People are looking for. Yeah. So they're looking, you know. Yeah. Pay it forward. So yeah. if you got a big chunk of money, if some new foundation came here and gave you a big chunk of money, what would you be pitching them on? Is there some other thing that you need to do or you want to just build on what you're already focusing on? So right now we're really wanting to build on what we're focusing on um, and hone in on what we do the best and be able to gather more data and measurements. You know, my team, we are spread pretty thin, um, but one area that's in our strategic plan actually is gaining more data on what we're doing to make sure we're doing it in a meaningful way. Um, we're also hoping to fund someone in Lake County just because right now a lot of our Missoula staff are driving back and forth for those programs and it's about 30% of the work that we're doing. So that's one that I would pitch to a foundation sure, and may somebody, have already yes, had. <laughs> no sense driving the hour and a half for each way every, you know, every time you have to go up there. Certainly. Yeah. Um, but really what I, my goal is to be able to get sustainable funding to pay my staff um, because I want to be able to keep them around long term and not have to rely on I was single foundations. At, I was just looking at that in your brochure. There's seven of you, right? Seven, yep. Yeah. We That's have six full time and then one part time. And volunteers? You have volunteers? We do. We just launched a volunteer program in the last six months. So we do a volunteer day once a month. Um, usually has two shifts, 12 to 1 and 5 to 6. And you can learn about that on our website. Scott, um, you can go over there and read books. To, to, <laughs> or to build some fairy kids. I can barely read. Or build some fairy What's kids. What's your website address? It's familiesfirstmt.org. Dot org. Yeah. Good. That's familiesfirstmt.org. You you You'd be excellent at preparing fairy kits, I think, Scott. <laughs> It'll be right up your alley. Well, do you use social media? Do you use other oh, yeah. pl platforms to kind of get the word out? Definitely, yeah. Where, we're, where can we find you there? We're um, on Facebook, Instagram, a little bit on LinkedIn, too, and it's at familiesfirstmt. At, okay, good. And do you, I'm imagining with families that you're working with, you have to get permission to do any kind of like outward presentation or you know marketing or what you're doing with them correct so for like photo release is that what you mean exactly yeah or so permissions yeah yeah we always ask permission um especially if we're, if we're doing kids programming you know asking the parents every time um for our parenting classes and this is like a thing that we're still trying to navigate but it's such a hard thing to promote because it's a a little bit heavier of a topic um when someone's seeking services for parenting classes they're not as open to just us taking photos of them in a parenting class. I would imagine they wouldn't want it. Yeah. Right. So we're trying to work through that and get testimonials from parents. Some parents have been willing to share their story from some of our programs. I think you're also, and Hannah, we, Arnie and I are here in the studio with Hannah. She's got a broad smile on her face. She's very <laughs> energetic. But I have to believe that you encounter some really tough stories along the way. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And what's it? I mean, how does that work for you and for your staff? And how do you kind of address those issues? Mm -hmm. um, so we always joke that we're a family within families first. <laughs> nice. So my team is really close knit. Um, we 
you know, at least once a month, try and do things that are non-work related just to be able to have a little bit lighter of a time because sometimes it can get really heavy. Um, We also have a lot of benefits for our staff now um, as of this year, which I'm really proud of to where if they need, you know, mental health support or to talk through some of that, they have access to being able to do that now. Um, So those are just a kind of a few ways. But but do you ever, I'm I'm imagining you, there are instances where do you ever have to bring the police in or child services or? Yep. Yeah, there are definitely times that that's happened. Um, Pretty rare, though, I would say. We do, at our parenting support classes, we normally have group agreements, and those are set forth by the parents. Um, So that kind of helps, you know, assess what's allowed behavior-wise. Our facilitators will step into if necessary, but all of those classes are also taught by local professionals. So they're social workers that are licensed, they're, you know, counselors, they have experience navigating tricky situations. Right. And I think that helps a lot on the parent side. Sure. And those staff are additional to your staff, those people that are coming in. Supplemental. So they're like temporary employees. Okay. Is how so they're, okay. they're, they're, they're contract in. employees. Like. Mm-hmm. Is there is there a version of Families First in Bozeman and in Butte and in Kalispell? Nope, there's not. We do have a sister organization in Boston, though. In Boston, Boston, yeah, clear across. So you're the, the US. only one in the state, mm-hmm. or in the region. That's, That's called f- families fast. <laughs> <laughs> Already did his best. <laughs> best Ted Kennedy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> park the car in Harvard Yard. But, but but I want to get back to Scott's point because you know I used to do some work in this area, and you know you bring in a family, yeah. and you don't know what you're going to get. You don't mm-hmm. know if there's you know abuse going on in the family. You don't know if there's. Uh, you know, um, some trauma that's happening. You don't yeah. know, uh, you know, if there's, I mean, anything could be going on, particularly if in a family is is seeking some sort of assistance. They may mask some of it, you know, or they may not even be aware right. of some right. of the things. I mean, you are providing counseling mm-hmm. and you're providing, you know, analysis and, and in-depth work with families. And and uh, do everybody get trained to, you know, to deal with that and see the, uh, you know, the implications of all that and what to do when it, when, a, when, you know, a seven-year-old kid starts talking about something yeah. that you weren't aware was going on in their life? Yeah. So, you know, we are mandatory reporters um, as one thing. But sure. Right. we try not to get, you know, other entities involved if we don't have to. Our staff is all um, trauma-informed, trauma-responsive uh, care. Sure. So we try and, you know go to as many trainings for continuing education on that as we can, especially as ever changing as it is. Um, We're also focusing a lot on diversity, equity and inclusion work now. So I think that's also a really, you know, big step forward and reaching groups that otherwise may not have been um, a huge priority in the past. And now we're trying to equal that playing field a little bit more with our staff knowledge. Yeah, Scott, one of the reasons I think that's important is because one of the unintended consequences of the pandemic and people working at home as you have in in many places you know now all of a sudden husband wife kids are all at home all the time every day right when before they had respite from each other you know, <laughs> one or more of them left and went out or you know there was a homemaker and and somebody that was gone you you create a different dynamic when you have that in-home contact on such an ongoing right. basis with no no release from that. Did mm-hmm. you see any uptick in the last couple of years of, of that kind of uh, life situation manifest itself in the in the kids and families you were working with? Definitely the parents. Um, yes. You know, the stress with parents during COVID-19. I mean, I know it's still a thing, but yeah. I think we saw it reach all-time highs. And what was really hard for us is adding another thing onto their plate was – even more overwhelming. So how do you reach, you know, a group of people that they don't want to take a parenting class because that's just another thing they're going to have to do in all this chaos. Um, and so that was something that we've, we're still sure. kind of navigating I mean, with. Forgetting the family, you just take two right. single, you know, people living in a place <laughs> together and all of a sudden they're both working out of the house and they're with each other 24 seven. Right. Yeah. It changes, it changes the nature of the relationship and puts different stresses and strains and, and, On and families. restrictions, even if it's just two people, let right. alone, in some of these cases, there are more than one child in a family, right? Mm-hmm. Some of the family units are two, three, four children and parents. you got five, six people at home together all the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it shows itself in a lot of different ways. And I think you pointed out more among the parents, you know, mm-hmm. the kids maybe like like the fact that everybody's around and, you know, that's one big family. But 
it, it changes the nature of how everybody interacts with each other and the pressures related to those. It's, sorts it's of also things. amazing that Missoula, and not surprising that Missoula is the home to this, yeah. to families first. Like our community is kind of unique and, int- and different. Like, well, we like to solve right? problems yeah. in this community, even though people complain that we don't solve. We, we're, we're a problem solving community. If there's some issue out there that is important and it has an effect on the quality of life for, for Missoulians, you know, there's usually an organization that uh, that wants to step up and, and help tackle it, what do just you like th- what you're doing. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, Especially. I think that's spot on. And I'd also say that Missoula, I've lived quite a few places, and Missoula just cares about other people. You know, when you go out, right. people are going to smile at you. They're going to greet you. And so that's what makes our community really incredible. Um, we're there for one another in hard times, yes, but even day to day. Even the the most grizzled of the individuals here who may identify different political, politically different, they're still good people. They're nice people. Right. You can't if there's somebody lying on the if there's somebody lying on the sidewalk unconscious in Missoula, someone's going to pay attention to it. In New York, they're going to step (laughs) over them. You know, pick their pockets. You know, whatever. (laughs) But I mean, here I think people they call it being rolled. Yeah, people people respond to other people in, in in crisis or an emergency. Yeah. People are very giving in that way here. Well, New York was founded on kind of the same types of services. Right. Right? Like there are so many services available to families in such a highly concentrated piece, you know, what what is it, twenty something square miles, whatever yeah. New York the is. The problem with that is they become they many of those services the became such long. large bureaucracies True. that they became top heavy and, and can't be as responsive as somebody more nimble like uh, you know, families first. Well that's so talk a little bit about that. Like fam Families First seems to be a good combination of private and public kind of funding and assistance, correct? Yes, we don't re- we don't receive any government funding. So nothing. Nothing from the government. How so, about tax breaks, things of that nature? Um. Wow, nothing. No, none of that comes to Families First. Well, there's some tax breaks for for giving for five hundred one c three. Yeah, gives. you yeah you definitely get you know t- us being a five hundred one c three. There's tax benefits to making donations, but in terms of you know, if you paying your taxes every year, those those dollars aren't going directly to our organization. How about grants and lots of grants. Got it. So family foundations, um, you know that sort of thing. Corporate foundations, we apply to a lot of those, but they're large chunks of money that just aren't sustainable, right? Because you can't guarantee right. that you're going to get a grant next year. Whereas if I go build a relationship with Arnie. And Sherman, you can't count on that either. So that's, that doesn't. Help I think we can situation. count on it. <laughs> let me ask you this. Let me let me ask you this. I know him. If a court refers somebody to you, they don't pay you anything. So they do, um, but Arnie, not the Arnie. court. <laughs> the individuals have to pay for it. Ah, so the court mandates that the individual pays for it. They they mm-hmm. they remand them to you for your services and then require them to pay it. Yeah. What happens if they can't pay it? Um, normally we'll work out some sort of payment plan because we've learned that it's important for folks to have skin in the game. Yep. Um, you know, we can't provide meals and childcare for free to everyone without these people having some skin in the game Right. and they're more likely to take the, the program seriously. So we do have payment fees and payment schedules that we can work out. Um, we have a reduced fee as well. So like our circle of security program, which is really founded around, um, parent child attachment with that zero to five age, Yeah. you know, that class is $120 for anyone that just walks through the door. But if you qualify for our reduced fee, it's only 60 and that's five weeks of class. Right. So, which is great. That's a, that's like one box of popcorn at the movie theater a week. <laughs> Uh, certainly an AMC. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how has something like the housing shortage mm. impacted you and your staff? Right? Because that, like, you know, you guys are in the heart of downtown. I know, yeah. no one, is anyone living downtown? We have one staff member that lives downtown. With um, nine other people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it's, it's tough. In fact, we actually just hired a new um, family education director that starts on August 1st. And she moved here from Utah. And one of the biggest things for me was trying to help her find housing because it was nearly impossible. And, you know, for on my end, the recruitment side is what's really tough in, you know, being able to make sure my team, especially if we have people coming in to Missoula that are hired, uh, can find housing. We also did a like community market analysis where we wanted to hear about what the 
community knows and has had their experience with Families First. Uh, so we went to a bunch of different locations and interviewed upwards of, I bet, like 200, 200 to 300 individuals. And we found, <laughs> I actually had to reframe one of our words because one of the questions was, what's the biggest struggle in Missoula for families? And nine out of 10 would say housing. So I had to reframe it to right. other than housing. Other than housing, <laughs> what is the biggest problem you have? Right. But also us coming in and helping support organizations that are on the ground trying to conquer those problems, right? Like how can we support them as our as partners and, um, you know, providing services to families that they might be serving, the YWCA, you know, Mountain Home, Montana, um, there's a whole bunch of them. That how how, are out how there. good was the name recognition for Families First? It was about six out of ten. That's pretty good, actually. It is good. Yeah. I so, mean, more. I like, like I said prior to us getting into the studio, I was like, boy, it's a bait and switch. Some people might think Families First is yeah. a right wing. Uh, You're the second person I've heard that from. Well, in I'm the very last cynical. <laughs> It might be a politically biased organization. Right, it might be a politically biased organization. Thank you, Arnie. Yes. Which I think has you know a lot to do with what's happening in our world right now. Right. Um, totally. You know, 28 years ago when we were founded, I don't think it's fine. Right. Well, people, people even didn't thought mask of that. Their We all want families to succeed. Right. People didn't mask their intentions with with uh, you know bright and shiny words. You know, <laughs> to, that doesn't really reflect what they're all about. Climate change. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but exactly. Let me let me ask you this though. Uh, I'm getting back to the person you just hired who came here from Utah. What was the outcome of their their um, apartment search or their housing search? What did they find? So, <laughs> they're moving in with you. No. <laughs> Turns out, yeah, I'm renting no. out my basement. No, um, we. I have quite a few connections in the real estate world, so I think I'm very privileged right. in that sense. Um, you know, I worked at Berkshire Hathaway for a little while before coming back to my my love of the nonprofit um, sector and. I re really relied on a lot of my personal connections nice. for things that weren't hitting the market quite yet um, and getting, helping get Because Missoula markets in. itself in terms of everything else, fun, recreation, mm -hmm. all the, you know, you can have a good time, see a lot of music, yep. enjoy yourself. But to your point, housing is always the biggest challenge. Yeah, definitely. You know, and expensive. I just saw that in New York City for the, it just... The average rental in the city just hit its all time high of five thousand a month. Amazing! It's the average, which is the you know, well, my son five forty five hundred for three of them in the in a shoebox in the East Village. Yeah, for nothing eight hundred square feet. Three so. bedrooms, but three bedrooms the size of the studio. Each yeah. bedroom's not, not even this big. Yeah, Hannah, who do you work for? Right. So is there a board? <laughs> yep. like, who do you report to? I have 12 incredible board members, and I hope that some of them are listening to this right now. Um, Shot call. Shout out to. <laughs> we'll send yep. it to them. It goes on. It goes up on uh, on podcast uh, starting on but, Monday. We'll send it to them. Yeah. But yeah. what makes what how do people get involved? Well, so first of all, so you have a board. Right. Mm -hmm. And what how often do you meet with them? How frequently? Yeah. So we meet every month. Um, Good. We meet quarterly in person, and then the rest are via Zoom, just because we all know how helpful that, that works, is to our right? busy lives. Um, but we have found a lot of benefit in meeting in person, so we have a little bit longer of a board meeting quarterly. Um, we also have board committees that are always accepting outside community members to join. So if you're like, I kind of want to join a board, not sure if I want to commit to three years quite yet, um, a committee is another great option for people to get involved. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So... so and your board members, I'm assuming, are chosen based on just different interests that they have. And so they could bring a lot of resources, per se, to the table. Yeah. Um, their interests, their backgrounds, um, you know, their, their knowledge and expertise. You know, for one, I had a lot of focus this year on gaining people with a lot of financial background for right. to be on our finance committee, too. Um, so I think it's really just like examining our matrix of board members and seeing, you know, what, what gaps are missing. We have a nurse practitioner on our board. We've had legal representation in the past, um, but folks that we can use as assets if we have questions about things um, to go to and also help guide us. And from an operational standpoint, does, do you pay to be in the library? Like, do you pay for resources and utilities and space? So, um, Yes, but not for like rent. 
Right. Um, so we have an agreement based on square footage, and this is for all the partners. So the the bond that was actually passed in Missoula um, didn't fund any of the nonprofit spaces. Right. Let's take a quick break. Right. Our guest is Hannah Zaroff. She is the executive director of Families First here in Missoula, Montana, back after this. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Hannah Zaroff. I've heard about the Montana Happiness Program. Tell me about that. Yeah. So uh, we became a part of that program last year. Um, and actually, Dylan Wright, who's on our team now full time as of a couple days ago, um, he is helping run a component of that called the Happy Families Initiative. So all of our parenting classes and even some of our child development work um, has this underlying message of increasing wellness and strength based um, happiness here in Missoula. So we know that when a family's doing really well and having, you know, more happiness, they're going to succeed a little bit better. And the whole goal of the Montana Happiness Project was aimed at suicide prevention. So it's taking, you know, this this big goal, a lofty goal, and reworking it in a way that's more strength based through wellness, happiness, um, s- focusing on things like savoring strong moments, gratitude exercises and those types of activities that we can do with families. Being happy with what you have. And sometimes you don't realize how yep. important what you already have is to, you know, making your mental health be uh, as strong as it could be. Absolutely. So tell me how volunteers can get involved again. Yeah. So again, we have a volunteer day uh, once a week, once a month, excuse me. And those are all posted on our website and missoulaevents.net. Um, we also have some really fun events coming up. We have a golf tournament on September 15th at Linda Vista Golf Course. So, yeah, Scott and I might want to wander over for that. We I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Grab two more and you have a whole team. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A foursome. A yeah. foursome. We could do that. A foursome, yep. Um, so we actually have two different starts for that. So we have a breakfast one in the morning um, with the shotgun start at 8.30. And then we have another one, I believe, at 4.30, followed by a silent auction and dinner. So that's September 15th. So when we win that tournament, what do we get? You'll just have to come and find out. Oh, okay, that's good. Golf that's clubs, Arnie, golf clubs. I don't need any more of those. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and what else you got planned? You got other things, other events and activities coming up in the, in the fall. What, what do we have? Yeah. So for any of you guys that are around uh, the Lake County area, we're doing a cornhole tournament in Polson at Glacier Brewing. That's going to be September 18th, which is a Sunday. And there's no Grizz football games that weekend. I triple checked it. Good. So that's going to be a really fun way for us to engage some businesses um, up in that area to help support that work. And then we are doing our... Halloween bash, which we had 1,200 families come to last year. Where? At the library? At the library. That's fantastic. It's on the fourth floor. It'll be on the 30th of October. The fourth floor is the floor. Oh, yeah. That's the one that has the big open space. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with the patio that overlooks Missoula. It's beautiful. It's incredible. People need to go and see it who haven't been to the library. It's really spectacular. Well, how can they do that? Good segue. Great Tell me. segue. Tell me out. <laughs> so if you haven't been to the library and want to check it out, I would love to give you a private tour with any of your friends or groups. Uh, we've done a lot of community group tours, business tours, but it's a really incredible s- space to get to check out. And the tours are special because there's a lot about the building that people don't actually recognize. Like for one instance, the, the stairs going up to the fourth floor are all switchbacks to kind of mimic our, our love for hiking yes. here in Missoula. So there's lots of little tidbits that you would get to learn about that building um, on a private tour. The fourth floor for they, do, we already, do. they do. <laughs> we do. We definitely do. When we put the radio station in there with Jesse and Tom, my engineer, we yeah. got the, the kind of infrastructure tour. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty impressive, impressive place. Yeah, t- totally. It's incredible. Totally. And the roof. We were on the roof. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, have, I was on the roof before it opened, but that was a long time ago. You've got a good the staff roof. there, too. Like the staff there that are just part of the library. I mean, you could tell that they're all kind of feeling their way through because it's still so new. Mm-hmm. But we're they, all learning. <laughs> you're all learning, but it's such an amazing space. Yeah. Well, it's what's like important, really the jewel of town. What's town important jewel. is a lot of people who think a library is just a bunch of books on shelves have to go see what libraries have 
you know, morphed into in, in, in this century. And they really are mm-hmm. a community focal point and a jewel for every community. Absolutely. Yeah, there, I heard a quote recently and it was, a community is measured by how strong their library is. And yes. I feel like ours has a lot to say about Missoula. We would agree with you. The, just for our listeners, give us the ways that they can contact you again, just in terms of, for Families First. Yeah, so you can reach out to us on social media at Families First MT on Facebook and Instagram. Um, you can mail us if you want to be old fashioned. Uh, it's at 455 East Main Street, downtown in the new library. And then you can also always give us a call at 406 721 7690 or send me an email at Hannah, H A N N A H, at familiesfirstmt.org. Or you can just walk in and go up there and yep. say hello. Yep, we always have people there 10 to 6, Monday through Saturday. We love it. You've been a great guest. We kind of have you back again. Yes, please. (laughs) Thank you, Hannah. It was really a pleasure having you on. And very, very entertaining and invigorating. (laughs) And invigorating. Yep. Thank you. Arnie, I will see you next Sunday. Next Sunday, Scott. Take care. Okay, you too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO, 